Welcome to West Coast Focus. I'm your host, Steve Zmack, and today's show is all about Alaskan photography. The most common photography joke I hear about Alaska is that the Alaskan landscape is so dramatic, vast, and fairy tale magical, and the megafauna and wildlife so up close and personal that for nature photographers, it's just plain cheating. As I began preparing for today's show and looking for local photographers who have shot the Alaskan wilderness, I was surprised to find so few. Even though many early West Coast photographers, such as Brett and Cole Weston, Robert Byers, and Henry Gilpin, have produced stunning imagery from there. Ansel Adams, Plate One, Portfolio One, is his famous Denali and Wonder Lake photo from 1948. And there's plenty more Alaska photography in his body of work, both grand and intimate in scale. Keeping that legacy alive today is our panel of three guests plus three other local shooters and an Alaskan who know the scenery of our least explored state so intimately that they soulfully capture the spirit of the Alaskan wild for us to experience and enjoy through their eyes. For me, Denali National Park is simply the greatest and most breathtaking place I've ever seen. Our first guest was born and raised in Switzerland and has photographed in 110 countries and in all seven continents. He has master's degrees in both business administration and physics and worked in high tech until turning pro photographer and educator in 2008. He uses a variety of cameras including Hasselblad, Nikon, Canon, Sony, and even the 160 megapixel Zeiss round shot. He was selected as a top 50 fine artist in 2016 by Photo Lucida, Best of the Best Emerging Fine Art Photographers by BW Gallerist, and won grand prize at the Reiko Center International Competition in 2014, as well as numerous other awards. He's been published in many magazines, including Black and White, Lens Work, and National Geographic. He's led workshops to Greenland, Remote China, and Bhutan, with new ones coming up in India, Mexico, Faroe Islands, Western New Guinea, and Zambia. He's authored several books, including one about grizzly bears, and traveled to Alaska at least once a year since 2006. It is a privilege to have Oliver Klink here today. Hi, Thank Oliver. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Our next guest is an internationally renowned marine biologist, photographer, public speaker, and author. Since 1974, she has studied marine mammals and owned and operated two research vessels, the 93-foot square-rigged sailing ship Varua and the 126-foot classic fantail Acania. She's taken her cameras to the polar ice cap, South Pacific, lagoons of Mexico, and the coasts of California and Alaska. She's hosted more than 3,000 students and scientists at sea, and her worldwide research and adventures have been the subject of television documentaries and festival-winning feature film and IMAX movie. She is a featured scientist in the 2008 film Humpbacks from Fire to Ice, narrated by Sir David Attenborough. <clears throat> her photos have been published in the magazines Alaska, Time, Audubon, Newsweek, and People, to name a few, and authored two books on whale behavior and one about Alaska for National Geographic. Her crowning achievement is her discovery of cooperative feeding among the endangered North Pacific humpback whales and was named a fellow in the Explorers Club in 1998, their highest level of recognition. She's been a close friend for almost 20 years. It is an honor to have Cynthia DeVincent in the studio today. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Our next guest took to the camera in high school. He has a Ph.D. from Rockefeller University and is a professor emeritus in the Physical and Biological Sciences Department at UC Santa Cruz, where he has also taught the photography course, Language of Light. He studied photography with Steve Crouch, Morley Bear, Al Weber, Phil Hyde, Dave Bond, 
Christopher Burkett, and Charles Kramer, and was a black and white workshop darkroom assistant to Oliver Gagliani. His printing techniques have included silver gelatin, platinum palladium, alternative processes, and infochrome, but currently he uses small format digital capture processing and printing. He's exhibited throughout California since 1977 at such venues as the Center for Photographic Art, Fioli House, Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History, and Monterey Museum of Art. His Alaskan and Arctic adventures include Valley of 10,000 Smokes in Katma National Park, Tatton Alask Rivers in the backside of Glacier Bay National Park, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Svalbard Island, and Ellesmere Island, all by backpacking, raft, or kayak. He's the membership chair of the Image Makers of Monterey. It is great to have Tom Schleich here. Hi, Hi, Tom. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Okay, let's get to it. Oliver, is Alaska cheating? Do we just drop our cameras in the, uh, on the ground and great pictures magically appear? So I, I do believe the reason I go to Alaska every year since, uh, as you mentioned, uh, about for the last uh, 15 years, is there is an intrinsic beauty. And then when you, you are there, you can really feel that nature has done something that if you open your eyes and you can really explore what it is, and it gives you this opportunity to make your very uh, creative images. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So is that easy to photograph in Alaska? I wouldn't say easy, right? Because you have to deal with the element, right? The mm -hmm. weather is uh, always very challenging. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with the distance, right? It's very remote. You can go to places very remote. But I believe if you plan your, your trip properly, then you get the reward, the reward accordingly. Right, don't spend all your time fussing with your gear. So, so <laughs> I think it's, it's like, especially when you go to very, very remote places, is, is not as if you're going to find something on the side of the road, mm -hmm. is you have to plan ahead of time. And then as Alaska is becoming more and more and more popular too, mm -hmm. it's getting crowder and crowder to the places that are common. But when you go in really remote regions, then you will find yourself alone there. Mm -hmm. So, which again requires some, uh, some serious planning for it. Mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia, how do you find photographing in Alaska and even out on the ocean? Well, um, you know, there's, there's something to be said for just a novice going up there. I have seen incredibly beautiful pictures taken by somebody with a point and shoot. But what's the old adage that uh, art is the lie that tells the truth, <laughs> it's very difficult to tell a good lie. And for mm -hmm. people who are really masters of photographing the landscape of Alaska, as are you, Steve, <laughs> um, just the magnificence, the grandeur of it is what makes it so difficult to capture. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned the distance. Distance is so deceptive in Alaska. What you think is five miles away might be 65 miles away. I mean, it's the, the air is pure and pristine, and the mountains are so grand, and everything is so beautiful that to really do it justice I think takes a tremendous amount of skill. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tom, what do you think? I would agree with that. I mean, my, my journeys into remote areas have always featured, as Oliver said, distance and the weather. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Photographing in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, a 12-day backpack trip, weight is a factor, protection from the elements, uh, physical stamina required to get, uh, to get in there. But once you're there, you begin to relax and open up to the, to the, to the landscape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you feel like almost it's so beautiful, <laughs> there are too many choices? And that's even the hardest, hardest thing is what to point your camera at first. Well, if you're on foot or in, in kayak, you're busy traveling <laughs> somewhere. So when you stop, you say, okay, mm -hmm. what, uh, what inspires me? What, what do I want to say in this area? How do I distill the essence of the wild? Into, into an image. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Cynthia, Cynthia how, how rapidly do you shoot? When, when you shoot, are you shooting um, a lot because the whales are going off and they're doing a lot and you never know what you exactly you're gonna capture? Or do you go out there and you sort of, you take your time out there for a moment before you even pick the camera up? Well, my primary objective out there is research. I'm there to observe what the animals are doing mm -hmm. <clears throat> and to do uh, recordings of the vocalizations. If I'm going to photograph to capture 
blue guide geese. It's an entirely different photography than if I'm going out there after my work is done and my observations are done to capture what I think is a beautiful image. Mm -hmm. And to be prepared for just to capture a beautiful image, I've got an array of cameras mm -hmm. from <laughs> close up 50 millimeter, 85 millimeter, 80 to 200, and 300. Mm -hmm. And then whatever's going to happen, no matter what side of the boat it's going to happen on, how close it's going to happen, because my subject are, is, is moving and is unpredictable. It's not a mountain in the distance. So I'm dealing with a lot of different elements and use my cameras to accommodate the, the uncertainty. When I'm uh, on the bus on the Kantishna Wilderness Trail, I've got the seat in the seat next to me, all three of my cameras lined yeah. up, wide angle lens, big telephoto lens, and then like infrared multipurpose. Exactly. Oliver, mm -hmm. you wide array of cameras. And that also, you know, what you have in when you're traveling, like on a boat or a bus, versus what you can actually fit in your backpack mm -hmm. and have in your hands. What challenges have you had? So I think the big challenge is that you want to kind of represent reality when you're in Alaska because we look at all those grandeur and all that stuff and the eye sees as a 50 millimeters. So if you start to shoot with a 500 millimeter lens, you're almost distorting the reality and then you bring basically your subject much closer, which uh, is not actually what happened, right? It does create some amazing images. But if you really want to give the feel of Alaska, is ideally you want to photograph with a 50 millimeters. Mm -hmm. That said, is do you want to be in the, uh, the space of a grizzly bear or a brown <laughs> bear at 50 millimeters, right? So it's probably not going to happen at mm -hmm. all the different places. Mm -hmm. But what I've really, really noticed myself to explore one region, and you feel that it takes three days to explore that region, you basically double that time. So instead of going for three days, you go there for six days. Mm -hmm. And I believe that you're going to get the personal feel of what it means to be there. Because mm -hmm. typically when you get to the place, you still have kind of your, your home kind of uh, in mind, what's happening, the plane ride and all that stuff. So it takes you a little bit of time to uh, acclimate. And then afterwards is, then after you jump and said, oh, I really need the shot, right? I really mm -hmm. need the shot because I'm here to get it. And eventually, it's on day four, on day five, that you start to really feel what you are there for. Mm -hmm. So it's really important, I think, to, to basically plan more time than what you would normally do when you, uh, you go to other places. Especially with the extreme weather up there. You need a big block of time because everything might be clouded over for a couple days. So that's true, <laughs> right? Is the weather, as we mentioned, so the weather could be really treacherous, right? Is I photographed the northern light, and the northern light, you can predict a little bit of what's going to happen, right? Is if you look at the University of Alaska, right, is the, uh, the forecast and prediction. But there is always things that, that happen. Clouds could be there. Mm -hmm. It could be too cold. Mm -hmm. is suddenly you're not ready with your equipment. You don't mm -hmm. have enough batteries or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I think, more important than anything else is when you come back home from Alaska, you need to have those stories. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I believe mm -hmm. uh, if you take a notebook and you write those stories, stories that you can tell basically your family, your grandkids, I think this is going to be even more important than the actual basically picture that you're going to bring, there, bring I, back. I found that so true when I returned from this last trip a, 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 in September and when I was posting on Facebook and writing my, my newsletter and writing the stories behind all mm -hmm. the photos, mm -hmm. I got much more positive feedback from people and so that's, I'm, I'm going that direction from now on. Okay, it's time to see some awesome photography from some of our guests queued up for your viewing pleasure. We have slideshows of Oliver Klink's and Cynthia DeVincent's photography. Um, now, normally, our music producer, Bill Speck, does all the original music for the slideshows, but we have something special today. Cynthia's son is a great guitarist, and he, so he has done the music for Cynthia's slideshow, Storm Nielsen. The song is Ghost Town. I hope you enjoy it. See you back here in a few minutes.
Welcome back to our discussion on Photographing Alaska, sponsored by the Arts Council for Monterey County. And if you're interested in hearing more of Storm Nielsen's guitar work, you can get that on his website at stormnielsen.com. Okay, so we're talking about stories. Everybody has a great bear story, and going to Alaska is the bear source. So, Oliver, what's your greatest bear story? So, I think is the uh, I photographed uh, a few different places in uh, in Alaska for bears, but the the first time I went to to Alaska with my family, I took my nephew there, and then we were at basically Brooks Falls. So that's where the typical bears just on the top of the waterfall trying to eat salmon, and then I took them to a remote place where we backpack for about seven days. So when we were at River Brook Falls, we were very close to the bear. I mean, there you felt, I said, oh my God, I can almost touch them. When you are in the wilderness, if you see a bear that is about 100 yards to 200 yards away from you, you start to feel that that guy is really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. So I think the difference, right, is the environment that you, uh, you have for me that, uh, that is unique. So photographing bear at close proximity is great, but having that bear in the middle of nowhere, and then you feel that you are in his territory. And then the thing is, what I always say there, right, is why would you go to Alaska to photograph bears versus mm -hmm. photographing bears in the uh, in a, in a lower 50? It's just about the environment. I mean, the environment is so beautiful, and then you can include that in your images that mm -hmm. makes for really a powerful story. And very different from shooting bears at Yellowstone, where it's a parking lot of cars on a road, and the bears right. are performing like they're in a circus. Right. Totally different in Alaska. Yep, correct. Cynthia. Oh, man, I have a few bear stories, but one really mm -hmm. stands out in my mind. <clears throat> and it's when I took a group of people, about 12 people, including my two children, uh, on a walk through the woods up to a beautiful river on an island. Uh, I think it was uh, Chichikov Island. And um, we, my son was fly fishing, and a big sow and her cubs stuck their head out very near him out of the bushes. And I said, okay, just go ahead and reel up, back off, and let's walk away slowly. Started walking away, and we got quite some just We headed back to the boat, and we were probably a quarter mile away, and I, I looked back, and I noticed the tops of the trees were moving, and I thought, what's going through <laughs> that? And then I looked down. What I hadn't noticed was we were getting full-on charged by the big sow um, at, through, coming through the brush, and her power and size was moving these saplings. They were very tall, just skinny little. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was a bluff charge when I realized that she was coming towards actually me. The other 12 people were, we were all pretty close together, but it was, this bear was heading towards me. I realized it wasn't a bluff charge and the bear was very close to being right on me. And my daughter could actually see its eyes engorged with mm. blood. And it was salivating. This was not normal bear behavior. And I always carry bear spray, and I also I, I carried a 44. And mm -hmm. I took the 44 out of the holster, and I stepped back to take a step, and my hind foot went in a hole. And I fell over backwards, which was exactly perfect from the bear's perspective. Not so good from mine. <laughs> And I, I, my son was sure I would have been mauled. My daughter was holding our little 10-pound Bichon, mm -hmm. a little white fluffy dog that was wearing a blue raincoat with a little blue hood. <laughs> the dog jumped out of her arms and charged the bear when the bear was just as close as you are. And the bear was so alarmed at this little rodent in a blue raincoat <laughs> that the bear flipped a buoy, <coughs> ran off through the woods with the dog right on her heels. If the bear had even stopped and, and Halo had run into the back of her, she would have hurt herself. <laughs> but the dog literally saved my life. Wow. Yeah. Tom, you've mixed it up with polar bears. Yeah, so <laughs> we were grounded by weather on uh, Barter Island. Uh, there's a little Inuit town there, Katovic. So we uh, camped out on the uh, dunes overlooking the Beaufort Sea. And in the middle of the night, all of 
of a sudden, pow, the side of that expedition tent caved in. And my wife screamed. I jumped up, looked out, nothing. Next morning, mm-hmm. polar bear footprint on the side of the tent and tracks going across the dunes. <laughs> Well, well, I don't have anything nearly as threatening. Uh, when I've been in Denali National Park and I have the protection of the bus around me, so I hang out the window. And one day I was with um, the head guide for Kantishna, Kirsty Natal, and we're going to see some of her photography later in the show. Um, but it was her day off, so she and I had the whole bus to ourselves, no schedule to keep. And we uh, further down the road, we saw the mom and her two small cubs. Um, just wandering up the road to us. So we just parked, turned the engine off, hung out the windows, photographed them for 45 minutes as they slowly made their way closer and closer and closer to us. And when she finally, when the mother bear finally passed me in the window, my 100 to 400 millimeter has a minimum focusing distance Mm -hmm. of six feet. And she got inside the six Mm -hmm. feet and Mm -hmm. it's just, the one shot I have is out of focus, and it's her eye and her fur. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you mentioned the word power, because that's how I always thought of it, too, is when she passed by, she didn't even look at me, but I could feel just the power radiating off her. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was really in the presence of something awesome there. Um, Oliver, we saw some great uh, northern lights from mm-hmm. you. Um, I was, I've always been denied northern lights this last trip. 10 days in a row setting my alarm to wake up and every time it was a clear night they weren't there if they were there it was a cloudy night and i was hearing about it the next morning from some nearby location uh what's your experience with northern lights how do you do it how do you what what's the best time of year so the best time of the year it's it depends if you want to uh to freeze uh to freeze in alaska right so i recommend (laughs) to go a little (laughs) further in a season like in march time frame Mm -hmm. Uh, they usually have clear night, and then you need to go to a place where it's really dry weather. Mm-hmm. So Furbanks, right? Furbanks or further north, that's actually an ideal place. Mm-hmm. What is very unique at those places there is basically is what I call the end of the road. You can actually drive that place, and you can set up is your foreground and the, uh, the northern light. Normally, is when I photograph northern light, you photograph at about about a 20 second. Mm-hmm. Just give you some idea at about 20 second. The one that you saw in the slideshow that is right above my head there, it was so strong that I had to photograph at about one-tenth of a second. Is otherwise it would overblown. And then the reason I had to photograph so fast because they were moving so that I could actually capture the essence. Otherwise, everything would have been really, really blurry. Mm-hmm. But that said, is I've, an old, I've always wanted to photograph the northern light inside Denali. So there is a place called the uh, Sheldon's Cabin. And the Sheldon's Mm -hmm. Cabin is an incredible place because you have that basically foreground. And uh, just to say that, it has been seven years, and I still haven't been able to actually schedule the right time to go to that uh, place, Sheldon's Cabin. Mm -hmm. So uh, an an unbelievable place to basically... So what you you want to do with the uh, the Northern Light is you want to protect yourself because the the big challenge is if you get too cold, you get to the inside of your car, and that's usually when the best northern line is going eh. to happen and you're, you're not going to be ready for it. Right, right. Uh, Cynthia, when you're uh, photographing the whales out on the water, how close do you get to them? And have you ever been a, a, a chance of you being thrown off your boat or your camera tossed into the water, anything uh, like that? Yeah, well, um, I really, because I'm trying to observe their behavior, I don't want to approach them. I don't want to interfere with them. I'm very adamantly against interfering with the subject matter I'm trying to study. And also, I have done enough harassment studies for National Marine Fisheries Mm -hmm. Service that I really have seen the effect of harassing whales. And people are really intent on getting their shot, and I'm the only one who's going to be harassing this whale. Well, there's a ton of photographers out there Mm -hmm. just getting that one shot that's important to them. Mm -hmm. So I try not, I really try to stay distant, but there, there was on one occasion when I was out, I'd been working for many, many hours with cooperative feeding whales, and these were in the, when we had first discovered the behavior. And I, I was really tired at the end of the day, 
and the whales were following fast moving schools of herring and so they were traveling quickly I didn't know where they'd come up next and I was out in a little Boston whaler and they would blow this ring of bubbles before they surfaced and I noticed a bubble coming up over here bubble 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 <laughs> and pretty soon this and I didn't want to take off I didn't want to move my boat and I'm tapping the side of the boat to let them know I'm there, but they have so much between the sound of the bubbles and the vocalizations, they're not hearing my tapping. The circle went around my boat, and I, because I have a, a, a hydrophone in the water, I can, I, and I know what the song, where, what's gonna happen within the, the parameters of the song, when they do the ooh, they're gonna burst through the surface of the water, mm. and I can see the white flip of their pecs mm. coming up towards me and I was in a little this was a little 13 foot Boston whaler and they lunged up and I literally had the upper jaw of two of the whales over the top of me and the lower jaw under the Boston whaler and mm. I thought well I might as well take a picture of it <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> right? of course so I grabbed the 50 yeah. <laughs> And it was too close. It was out of focus. But I do have that shot, and it shows a little herring going across <laughs> the screen. Yeah, yeah, right. Right, right. That's, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Okay, well, it's time to take a break and see some more Alaskan photography from our local talent pool. Uh, Tom Hurl is going to give us a uh, broad cross-section of the Alaskan wilderness with hints of whimsy. Peter Hemming is going to drop us right into the middle of the eagle's nest, and Annalise Decatur is going to take us through some dramatic land and seascapes with some accents of wildlife. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Welcome back to our discussion on Photographing Alaska, sponsored by the Arts Council for Monterey County. And the Arts Council has awarded us a grant to cover all of our production costs for all of 2018, so we're very excited about that. Um, 
And West Coast Focus has an extra special connection to the Arts Council because Ansel Adams in 1982 led dedicated civic, arts, and business leaders to create this agency as part of a nationwide movement powered by the National Endowment for the Arts. The mission of the Arts Council for Monterey County is to improve the quality of life for everyone in our region through the arts. So, Tom, now uh, you're all educators, which is great. So, Tom, uh, what's the more, most important thing you want your students to take away from their Alaska experience? My sense is that I want them to gain an appreciation of wild areas and the essence of wilderness. To me, that's the most important. The photography comes second. Mm. Cynthia? I, at the end of a voyage, uh, I would always ask my students, what was the most significant you know, event that happened to you during this? And one of my students said, the day my camera broke. <laughs> he stopped looking at everything through the viewfinder. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really what my takeaway is for students. It isn't the photography, it, that isn't everything. It is being there in this amazing place. So stop looking through the viewfinder the whole time <laughs> and actually mm -hmm. witness what you're, what you're looking mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. I find that incredibly challenging to mm -hmm. do. I try, but I always run and get the camera. You know, yeah. It's only seconds pass before I see something and I have to go get the camera, mm -hmm. Oliver. So I, I think is the, usually before you go on a trip, you get really ready, right? I get my student, you get ready. I said, here, you're going to have your equipment. You're going to practice before you go there. So you want them to build their confidence, their technical confidence, so they can be creative when they are there. Mm -hmm. So when you are there, you're a little creative. You look at basically Google, what Google, basically what other people have photographed, and you don't want to come back with exactly the same images. But one thing that is really important that I teach, right, is to my student is that we all want to basically protect the environment. This is really dear to our heart. But is what we need to remember is what today is like. If we can just stop today what is like today and then protect the environment from today going on, mm -hmm. is where well, the world would be much, much better. Mm -hmm. Now the challenge that we have, we tend to forget and then it's not today, but it's going to be a week from now, two weeks from now, about a year from now. Mm -hmm. So for my students, right, and then they can look at my website, www.incredibletravelphotos, right, to go on the, on the different workshop. It's more about the idea of, as we, we spoke early on, telling a story. Telling a story that actually match with your images. And it's not coming back with 30,000 images, but it's really those 10 images that you really feel that uh, is you that, were, that was in Alaska instead of someone else. That's mm -hmm. the, um, yeah. Based on all three, I'm going to have to re, I, I can't give an answer now because I have to totally reevaluate my answer based on <laughs> what you all have said. But this is a good segue into using our photography for philanthropy and social action. Tom, issues of conservation close to you. Actually, I've not ventured there. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my take is to experience remote wild areas mm -hmm. and photograph what I feel. Mm -hmm. And how important it is to like, keep some areas in our, in our world wild and pristine. Well, it's incredibly important. In mm -hmm. fact, um, what initially attracted me to Alaska was Dave Bowen's book, Ram mm. uh, Rambles Through an Alaskan Wild Place. And he described this area and <clears throat> he talks about the necessity of protecting these wild places and not going in there with large groups, going in there in small groups, preferably by yourself, although that, I think that's incredibly mm -hmm. dangerous in, mm -hmm. in these, uh, in these uh, um, areas, and uh, experience the landscape on its terms, mm -hmm. not on somebody else's terms. And I feel like when you have that experience, the, the instinct for conservation comes naturally. You're so uh, blown away by Alaska in your soul, y your first thought is, oh, this would be a great place to put a huge hotel, or we need another cruise ship port here. The feeling we come back with is we have to keep it this wild. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, but mm -hmm. how, do, how do you do that? Do you keep going back and back? Do you, do you make these areas uh, accessible, or do you, uh, uh, or do you uh, hinder uh, 
entrance. Right, uh, Cynthia. Bad roads make good filters. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Cynthia, you have the Inner Sea Foundation. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I've, I've struggled with this very question for a long time because I think if we want to protect the wilderness, we want to protect wildlife, people have to have an awareness of it. Mm -hmm. They have to actually feel it in their heart. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who are the furthest interested in protecting the environment are people who don't have access to it very poor, mm -hmm. very wealthy, mm -hmm. who could care less, uh, or, you know, just people who don't experience. So we, you really want to touch, if you want to touch the mind, you've got to touch the heart. Mm -hmm. And that means exposing people to these areas. On the other hand, I think there should be huge swaths that are kept completely protected. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there are certain areas where, you know, if, Let's protect as best we can, but kind of throw in the towel, but let everybody go there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that there's a balance that can be met there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know Denali National Park uh, makes a huge effort mm -hmm. to keep it wild, and that 93-mile long road is very limited. Perfect. Only the you know sanctioned tour buses mm -hmm. can be all the way on that road, whereas most private vehicles or RVs are only limited. They can only get about 20 20 miles in, um, but still I'm noticing more and more buses on the road and more and more people traveling there. And Princess Cruises just set up, they bought one of the lodges in the park just mm -hmm. to be more efficiently bring in more of their guests. And the, the original thinking behind national parks was conservation, but if nobody knows about it, then nobody knows to conserve it and there's no political mm -hmm. will to do that. Oliver, you've uh, initiated several campaigns mm -hmm. of conservation with your photography. Tell us about that. So, to me, I think is like, for example, like I have this uh, little book there, right? Is it starts with the kids. Ah. So, it starts with the kids. And then, really, what is very important to me is to actually print my images and to have them hang in public places. Like, I'm just doing an exhibit here in Monterey now at the Miss. Because everybody has ADD. When you go online and then you basically look at those images, is what's happening is people have a tendency to forget and they want to see something else. When they actually stand in front of images like this, they start to connect and said, oh my God, this is incredible. That's basically. And I think is for every photographer, right, is that's what I preach you know, for them, right, is your little image that you're going to put in a coffee shop or that you're going to put at your desk in your office or that you do in a cafeteria, this is going to be more powerful than anything else that other people have, have done. So that, I think, is really, really critical. Mm -hmm. Print your images and show it to, your, show it to people to so enjoy. Good. Well, um, it's time to see some more photography, this time from Tom Schleich and myself, of course, to the original guitar work of Pacific Grove's own Bill Speck. We'll see you back here to continue the discussion in a few minutes.
Welcome back to our discussion on Photographing Alaska, sponsored by the Arts Council for Monterey County. Now, Alaska being so far north, a big chunk of it in inside the Arctic Circle, how is the light different there? Cynthia, what do you think? Well, I think that it's almost as if the higher the latitude, the better the light, the trickier the light. Mm. Uh, as an example, um, I spent uh, a lot, uh, several years living in a tent on the edge of the polar ice cap off Point Barrow, mm -hmm. which is the northernmost point of the United States. Mm -hmm. The light there was fantastic. I mean, we're talking about 24-hour sunrises and 24-hour <laughs> sunsets. Mm -hmm. But the light itself played tricks, the refraction of the light, so that, as an example, one day I was in a whiteout sitting on the top of, of a, I, I would pick a nice tall iceberg as a perch, and I'd sit up there to observe bowhead whales. It was a whiteout, kind of a fog on the water, and here were these whales being refracted on the light into the sky. So there were these whales swimming through the sky. Mm. And that's what I mean about the tricky light of the northern latitudes. And right. consequently, you can get some of the most delicate colors and some of the most, you know, of course, the northern lights. Mm -hmm. and all, uh, Light's an important part of the northern latitudes. Mm -hmm. Tom, your thoughts? Uh, <clears throat> light is extremely important in the northern latitudes. It's gentle. It's soft. Uh, it goes on 24 hours a day. Uh, in this, uh, in, in this summer. Light can play tricks, the uh, refraction phenomenon you, you talked about. I mean, you can see that on a, on a highway when, you, uh, when you're driving with the, the, the heat waves. Right. So there's a, a marvelous array of colors. Read Barry Lopez and his description of the Arctic light. I mean, the, mm -hmm. and he, wonderful writer, and, and talks about uh, the qualities uh, there. So. At other times, it's socked in, <laughs> and it's gray, zone five. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oliver? So I think if you look at the artists, right, if you look at painters or people that really create art, their dream is to actually paint in the uh, northern, really far north, because they have this palette, these colors that don't exist, that we're not used to it. Mm -hmm. And us as photographers, I think again, right, is we don't spend enough time to basically observe what that light is about, that quality of light. But what I really like about Alaska is the changes that happen. It's never ever constant. So you could be half an hour apart and the light could be really, really different. Mm -hmm. For me, I'd rather photograph kind of in the September time frame when there's a little bit of changing light versus mm -hmm. the June 21st mm -hmm. of the 24 hours light. But I've also photographed in December when there it's basically pitch dark really, really early, early on. And there you can actually really give the feel of that palette of light that exists in Alaska, more that grayish light and uh, those subtle lights. There. Mm -hmm. so. I love um, how with the passing clouds, it's almost it's very similar to Hawaii where storms just sort of roll through, dump a bunch of rain, and then sunlight breaks through the clouds, and it's sort of a, a cycle with that. And being so far north, it's even in the summertime, you've got that low sun. It's mm -hmm. always it's always like mm -hmm. if the sun is out, direct sunlight, you've got winter light with long shadows. But often when the sun just drops behind the veil of a cloud and it's just rain, so all those autumn colors are mm -hmm. all wet mm -hmm. and just the flatness of the soft box light saturation, just mm -hmm. explosive. Mm -hmm. and, and I really love that. Um, so... Uh, what would you say is uh, the most spiritual experience you've had in Alaska, and did you do you have an image to represent that? So I, I really think is especially when you photograph wildlife is there is unpredictability. You can you are not in a zoo, right? Is there is unpredictability. But for me, there was one of the images that was shown where I'd photographed bear for probably about, it was my 10th or 12th trip. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you have these two little cubs and it's really wet on the ground. Mm -hmm. And the mom is trying to make them go across that wet ground. Those guys do not want to get wet. So what did they did? What they did is they climb on the mom's back. 
And then there you see basically the mom basically tra strolling around and with a two little bear on the back uh -huh. is was amazing. There it's not about light, it's just about that atmosphere and that feel, that behavior that I'd heard about it is I seldom see those images and eventually when you're there it's, it's precious. And you see usually the little white of the, uh, the bear's eyes looking at you and he said, oh my God, <laughs> please, please take a picture, right? Don't miss this one there. So it, it was like amazing. Cynthia? Oh boy, I have an image seared into my mind forever. And it was that uh, it happened late at night. Uh, the ship had gone to sleep and that was my favorite time to jump in a little whaler and head out on my own. And I headed out and the northern lights started. And I wasn't aware, I hadn't checked the, the website or anything to know when it was going to, all of a sudden the northern light started happening. And around me are a number of whales. And all of a sudden this whale came up and breached with the northern lights behind it. And it was a time of, of, of a lot of phosphorescence in the water. And as this whale arced around and landed down in this huge big splash and then dove down, it was just this, all these stars in the water of the phosphorescence glowing. Mm -hmm. It was pretty impressive. No, I didn't take a picture, but I got it. <laughs> right here, <laughs> right, right. Tom? I would have to say, standing in front of Mount McGeek uh, in the Valley of 10,000 Spokes and pending storm giving homage to this volcanic mountain. Mm -hmm. That is seared in my mind. Right. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the experience of aerial photography. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm so moved about you know, being in Denali National Park, but the one hour I spent in a small plane circling Denali Peak on a clear day and flying through the mountains, over the glaciers, at one point, I, I had to put the cameras down because I, I, I was crying. You mm -hmm. know, I was just, I've mm -hmm. never been so emotionally moved before. Okay, so now let's see some great photography from my favorite Alaskan guide, Kirsty Natel. Uh, she's the head guide for the Kantishna Wilderness Trail in Denali National Park. She's been doing that for over 20 years and uh, driving that 93 mile long Kantishna Wilderness Trail uh, with her bag of cannon gear at her side. And in the off season, she lives in Fairbanks and travels the rest of the country photographing it. And she's as entertaining as a, as a guide as she's talented, a photographer. It is my pleasure to show you the work that has inspired me so much. Welcome back to our discussion on photographing Alaska. Oliver, when are you getting back there? So I've been working on a very large project called Consequences, right? It is the effect of modernization on people around the world. Now, I do want to go back to Alaska next year in Kotzebue. Kotzebue is where I have photographed them. 
with the little kids is that are basically showcased by the parents mm -hmm. and then that they were basically what the people have hunted. So mm -hmm. that I'm really looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, when are you going back? Oh, I hope to get back next summer. I'm working on a project with the New York Film Academy. They'd mm -hmm. like to establish a satellite campus in Southeast Alaska and we're trying to get that put together. Wow, exciting. Tom? We hope to get back there next summer, mm -hmm. uh, hang out in Hames and Skagway. Mm -hmm. Explore the, the Yukon, mm -hmm. adjacent to Alaska. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, next summer I'm hoping to get back to Denali for a, a third trip and bust out of Denali a little bit and see the rest of the huge state. Even though Denali National Park is the size of a small New England mm -hmm. state in itself, mm -hmm. but yeah, much bigger place. Okay, well you don't want to miss Roman Lawrence's exhibit going on right now at the Center for Photographic Art through February 18th, and I'll be giving a talk on drone photography at CPA along with Robin Ward and Joel Gam Board on February 15th. You can get all the details about that on their website at photography.org. The Padre Trails Camera Club uh, currently has an exhibit up at the Pacific Grove Art Center. A lot of talent in that group, so you don't want to miss that. And check out Mundo's Sandwiches in Monterey and their ongoing photography exhibits. And currently on exhibit, there's Batista Boone Studio Photographers. Remember to get and post all your Monterey County photo event info at Monterey Peninsula Photo Events. That's MPEN Photo events.blogspot.com. That's our program. Thank you, Oliver Klink, Cynthia DeVincent, Tom Schleich. And a big thank you to Tom Hurl, Peter Hemming, and Annalise Decatur for sharing their photography with us today. Uh, Bill Specht and Storm Nielsen for the music. Michael Martins directing the show from the control room. And of course, a huge thank you to our sponsor, the Arts Council for Monterey County. Tune in March 8th when we explore the creative careers of distinguished guests Rick Murray and Bob Kohlbrenner, plus more. And you can view past episodes of West Coast Focus at your convenience at stevesmack.com, West Coast Focus TV. And as always, you have my word. You will see at least 100 photos per episode. We saw more than 120 today. May the Grizzlies hold their poses and Mount Denali always be visible. Thanks for focusing on the West Coast. Now get off the couch and start your adventure.